for number 20, we want to have approximate solutions to cosine of theta equal to negative 0.43 on the interval negative 2 pi to 2 pi. Well, if we start with our equation, then we need to get rid of the cosine on the left-hand side so we can get theta by itself. Because when it says approximate solutions, it means solve for theta. So we'll take cosine inverse of both sides. And we end up getting theta left over on the left-hand side. And cosine inverse of negative 0.43. Now, we need to make sure our calculator is in radians because the uh, interval is in radians. Plugging this into our calculator, we get negative point cosine of negative point inverse of negative point four three is two point zero one five, and it says round to two decimal places, so I'll round that two up to uh, that one up to a two. Now, where is this on the uh, unit circle? If we think about it, the cosine inverse, well, two point zero two is less than pi. So, and we know it's going to be more than pi over 2, so it's going to be in the, in the second quadrant. We can also think of it because cosine in, inverse works in the first and the second quadrant, but cosine is negative in the uh, second and the third quadrant. So we see that the overlap is in the second quadrant. So we know we're going to be in the second quadrant. Of that theta. Well, where else is there an interval? Where else is there an answer where cosine of theta is equal to negative 0.43? Well, where else, where, else is, where else is cosine negative? It's negative in the third quadrant. So we also have an answer here. Now, to figure out how to go between the, se the second and third quadrant in this case, we want to look at the reference angle. And we see that these two reference angles are, are identical. So if we think this is pi here and this is going to be theta, to find the re this reference angle, I'll, I'll mark that as like a, a phi. We'll say phi is equal to pi minus theta, and that'll give us that reference angle. But then what we want to do is find this new angle here. I'm going to put a theta subscript 2 just so we know it's a different theta. Well, theta 2 would be equal to pi plus whatever phi is. So it, once we find phi, we can uh, plug it back into here. Or if we combine these two equations, we get pi plus pi minus phi of 1. So we get theta 2 is equal to 2 pi minus phi of 1. So we're going to subtract, we're going to add, we're going to subtract phi, uh, theta, the 2.02 that we found up here, from 2 pi. Another way we could think about this is... If we were to look at it uh, where we have an answer up here in the second quadrant, the negative of that answer is going to be in the third quadrant. So if this is theta, this is negative theta. And so uh, that would be the same as this negative theta here. But we want the but if we were looking for an answer between 0 and 2 pi, negative theta would be equal to negative 2.02. .02, so we need to add 2 pi to that. And we would get an equivalent theta, which would be the same thing as 2 pi minus the theta, that we, minus the theta we had before. So either way we think about it, we, we find to go from the second to the third quadrant, we're going to subtract the, the theta that we have from 2 pi. Doing that, we find theta 2 is equal to 2 pi minus 2.02. and we end up getting theta 2 is equal to 4.26. Now, we need to get answers between negative 2 pi and 2 pi. Right now, we have our answer. We have two answers, both of which are between 0 and 2 pi. So we need to find their equivalent answers between negative 2 pi and 2 pi. 
So when it, once these are all the answers we can get between 0 and 2 pi. To find the other answers, uh, we need to either add or subtract 2 pi. Those will find at the equivalent angles. Well, we know we don't need to add 2 pi because we're already between 0 and 2 pi. So if we add 2 pi, we're going to leave our range. But if we subtract 2 pi from our answers, we'll get another set of answers. So I'll take my theta 1, which is 2.02, .02, and I'll subtract 2 pi from it. And I end up getting negative 4.263, which all round is the negative 4.26. And then if I take my theta 2, which is 4.26, and I subtract 2 pi from it, I'll end up getting negative 2.2. .2. One thing we should immediately notice is that this answer is the negation of this answer up here. I'll do it right. This answer up here is the negation of this answer down here. And this answer right here is the negation of this answer right here. So it's the same as finding the equivalent angle just going uh, in the versus going clockwise versus going counterclockwise. So there's a couple ways you can think about it, uh, but the point is that we end up getting four answers. Uh, Listing them in increasing order, we get negative 4.26, negative 2.02, .02, and then their positives, 2.02, 4.26. And so that's number 20. Go ahead and circle that to say that we finished that. I'm going to erase the margin so I have room for 21. For number 21, we're going to try to solve for, sin for theta. Well... Whenever we're trying to solve for a variable, we want to get that variable by itself. So theta is inside of sine theta, so we need to get sine theta by itself. I'll start by distributing this 5. Then I want to get all my thetas to one side and my constants to the other side. So I'm going to... I'm going to subtract sine, negative sine 3 theta from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. I'm going to add 5 from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So I'll get 5 sine of theta minus that 3 sine of theta I moved over is equal to the, seven, the negative 7 plus the 5 I moved over. Simplifying that, we get 2 sine theta is equal to negative 2. Divide by 2, we get sine theta is equal to negative 1. Now I want to think, well... We could do sine inverse to both sides here, and we and take sine inverse of is equal to, of negative one and get theta. However, we can also ask ourselves when is sine theta equal to negative one? These this is a special case on the unit circle. If we remember that the x y coordinates correspond to cosine and comma sine, we can think when is the y going to be negative one? Well, on uh, the x-axis, the y is 0. This is at the point 1, 0. And the x, on the other side, it's also negative 1, 0. But on the y-axis, the cosine is 0 and the sine is 1. Versus here, the cosine is 0 and the sine is negative 1. So where do we see sine of theta is equal to negative 1? Well, sine is the same thing as the y-value. So where is that negative 1? It's negative 1 right here. So what's the angle there? Well, if you remember that this is 0 and this is pi... This is pi over 2, and this is 3 pi over 2. So we see that the answer that we have, the only place where sine of theta is equal to negative 1, is at 3 pi over 2. And that's going to be in radians, because our interval is going to be in radians. says to be in radians. That's the only answer between 0 and 2 pi, so we're done with that. Now on to number 22. Find exact solution to cosine theta is equal to 1 over 4 cosine theta. Well, just like with any equation, we'll start by trying to get our theta by itself, but it's inside of cosine, so we'll get cosine of theta by itself. I'd start this by multiplying both sides by 4 cosine theta. That way I can cancel it on the bottom here. 
So if I multiply the right-hand side by 4 cosine theta, it'll cancel. And the left-hand side, it'll give me 4 cosine. Well, cosine theta times cosine theta is going to be cosine squared of theta. It's equal to 1. Divide by 4, and I get cosine squared of theta is equal to 1 over 4. Then I'll take the square root, and I get cosine theta is equal to uh, the square root of 1 over 4, which I can simplify that to be 1 half. But there's one thing I have to keep in mind. When I take the square root, I get a plus or a minus. So now I have to work this looking in both cases. One where cosine of theta is equal to positive 1 half. The other where cosine of theta is equal to negative 1 half. Well, let's take the top one first. If I, I'll do cosine inverse to both sides. And I get theta is equal to cosine inverse of 1 half. If I plug this into my calculator, making sure it's in radians because our, uh, well, actually it doesn't matter. It doesn't specify whether it wants it in radians or degrees. So you could do either one. But if I do cosine inverse, I'm going to get this uh, decimal if it's in radians. If I do it in degrees, I end up getting that theta is equal to 60 degrees. Now, if this said to do it in radians, you could still find it. If you remember that you've got a special unit, so you've got a special right triangle, where the theta, well, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So this is actually a 30, 60, 90 triangle. So 60 degrees is the same thing as pi over 3. So you could still do this even if it said to define in radians. That's only one answer, though. So we have to ask ourselves, where's the other answer where uh, cosine uh, theta is equal to cosine inverse of 1 half? Well, we got an answer in the first quadrant. So where else, where's, the second, where's the second answer? It's going to be in the fourth quadrant because that's where cosine is positive. If we have this as theta, this reference angle is going to be the same thing, but it's going to be a negative theta. So we find that negative theta is negative 60 degrees. So we have our second answer is negative 60 degrees. Now we want to take this second, this second problem, cosine theta is equal to negative 1 half. If we do the inverse cosine of both sides, and we plug that into our calculator, we end up getting theta is equal to 120 degrees. But where's the other solution for this? Well, 120 degrees is going to be in the second quadrant, and cosine is negative in the second quadrant. That makes sense. The other answer is going to be right here. If you remember back to uh, question number 20, to find the, the uh, similar angle, we, in this case, I'm going to call it theta, this will call it theta 3. Oh, pardon me. This, this angle here is theta 3. To find the equivalent angle uh, in the fourth quadrant, we're going to take 2 pi and subtract our previous angle. So, if, no, but we're not going to do 2 pi this time because we're doing degrees now. So I'll do 360 degrees. If I do 360 degrees minus 120, I end up getting 240 degrees. So now I have a set of answers. I have 60 degrees, 120 degrees, 240 degrees, and I also have negative 60 degrees. Well, if we look at the unit circle, this has some significance because it says find all the exact solutions. So we, this is only four of the exact solutions. So, but we don't need to find all the exact solutions in any range. Let's look at the unit circle, though, for a second and figure out if we can find an equation that relates them. We found an answer up here that was 60 degrees. We found an answer down here that the reference angle was negative 60 degrees. Then we found one up here, and we found one down here. The relationship between these two lines is that they're diagonal from each other. And the relationship between these two lines is because they're diagonal from each other. They're across from each other. They make a straight line. This is because we had this square root up here that causes us to take the plus or minus. 
So if we found this, uh, if we found this answer in the first quadrant, all we have to do is add pi to that to get the equivalent answer in the second quadrant. So I can write that as 60 degrees plus, but I'm not going to add pi to it, of course. I'm going to add 180 degrees. And I'll write it times k. So k is for any constant uh, integer. So if I add 120, if I add 180 degrees, I'll, I'll end up in the second quadrant. Add 180 degrees to that, I'll end up back in the first. If I end up subtracting uh, 180 degrees, I end up just going around the opposite direction. The other solution we have is where we were started in the second quadrant, in the, in the fourth quadrant, pardon me. If we, so we have negative 60 degrees. If I then add 180 degrees to that times k, I'll end up in the second quadrant here. And so I found an equation that finds all exact solutions. The equivalent equation in uh, radians, well, all we have to do is convert this to radians. 60 degrees in radians is pi over 3. 180 degrees in radians is pi, k. And then we also have... And then we also have negative pi over 3 plus pi k, because negative 60 degrees is negative pi over 3. The last thing we should do is make sure that we have uh, negative pi over 3 in a more standard form. So we'll move it to the, we'll add 2 pi to that, and we'll get 2 pi over 3. We'll add pi away and get 2 pi over 3. For number 23, so for number 23, we're looking at a particular week, the temperature in the lake changes by a sinusoidal function. So let's, uh, for something like this, you definitely want to draw out the graph of it. So it says that the maximum, sorry, the minimum temperature occurs at, is 45 degrees, and it happens at 4 a.m. And the maximum temperature is 55 degrees, and it happens at 4 p.m. So uh, somewhere in here, there's the middle. When is the, tem when is the, when is the temperature of the lake 50 degrees? So to try to find this, we then need to see on the graph where it's going to be, or try to find the equation of it. Well, 45 to 55, the, right in the middle, is 50. So it's basically asking, where's the midline of it? Well, let's see if we can find an equation for this graph. So it's going to start at the lowest point, is at 4 a.m. at 45, and the highest point is at 55. So, so the minimum happens, and then it goes up to the maximum. So if we were to look at this kind of zoomed out, it would look like this, where here is 4 a.m., and here is 4 p.m., and then we'll go back up again uh, the next time it got to 4, uh, 4 a.m. the next day. Well, the midline is going to occur right in the middle of it there. So the question is, what's the middle time? Well, between 4 a.m. and 4 p.m., well, from 4 a.m. to 4 p.m., those are 12 hours apart. So what's uh, halfway across that? Oh, pardon me. I'm starting to finish things. How we cross that is six hours. Six hours from 4 a.m. gives us 10 a.m. And so uh, if you think about it, from the minimum to the maximum, it's going to have to cross across the midline. And it happens exactly halfway between the maximum and the minimum on a sinusoidal function. So that happens at 10 a.m. But that's not the only time. When else, where else is it going to happen at 10 a.m.? Well, when it goes back down through the midline. When's that going to happen? Well, it crosses the midline from uh, six hours away from 4 p.m., so it's going to also cross the midline six hours after 4 p.m. Well, what's six hours after 4 p.m.? That's 10 p.m. So we have to have both of those answers. Now we look at number 24. So this is if A of R is the area of a circle with radius R and V of A is the volume of the cylinder with circle base of area A and height 3 feet, then they give, a me me give the meaning of V A of R. Well, this functional notation always says that something like V of A 
is saying that the volume is in terms of the area. And A of R is saying the, the area in terms of the, of the radius. So if we have V of A, that's the volume in terms of, of area. So then if we have V of A of R, what are we replacing the A with? We're replacing with A of R. So we have the volume in terms of, but instead of the area, we're going to have an equation, uh, we're going to have the area in terms of the radius. So if we have the volume in terms of something that's in terms of the radius, we end up having the volume is in terms of the radius. This in terms of meaning is just, it's saying the function of the volume depends on the radius. So the V of A of R means the volume of a cylinder with radius R. You could use with, you could use in terms of, defined by, it doesn't really matter, just as long as you're clear that the volume depends on the radius R. For number 25, it says g of h of x is equal to 1 over x squared plus 12x plus 3x, plus 36, sorry. And it says find a possible equation for g of x and h of x. Given that g of x does not equal x, h of x does not equal x. Dang. Okay, well, uh, what this is saying is that h of x, g of x is composed of h of x. So we need to figure out, is there a function inside of another function? Well, let's look at 1 over x squared plus 12x plus 36. See if we can find one function inside of another function. The first thing we could see is that this is a this uh, x squared plus 12x plus 36 is a function all by itself. So what if we said that h of x was equal to x squared plus 12x plus 36? Well, then g of x is going to be equal to 1 over h of x. Sorry. Let me correct that. G of h of x is going to be equal to 1 over h of x. So what would g of x be? Well, g of x would be whatever is the same thing as g of h of x, but instead of replacing uh, x with h of x, we're going to replace h of x with x. So normally you plug in something into x in order to normally you plug something into x to... Uh, replace it in the equation. Well, here we have h of x. So we're going to replace h of x with x. So we, we, if we do that, we get 1 over x instead of h of x. Now, that's one, so that's one possible equation for h of x is x squared plus 12x and g of x is 1 over x. If we look at another one, we have 1 over x squared plus 12x plus 36. Well, maybe we could factor this bottom uh, fraction. So we get 1 over, uh, let's see, this would factor to x plus 6 squared. Yeah, if we, fa if we do x plus 6 times x plus 6, we will get x squared plus 12x plus 36. So this factors to 1 over x plus 6 squared. Well, then this x plus 6 is in itself a, fra a function. So what if we say h of x? is equal to x plus 6. Then g of h of x becomes 1 over h of x squared. So then what, is g of, what does g of x have to be? g of x would have to be, well, just like on this problem when we replaced h of x with x, we're going to replace h of x here with x. So this h of x is here, so we're going to make that an x, and then it's still squared. So g of x is 1 over x squared. Number 26 now. Number 26 is giving us equation uh, compositions functions u of v of x and v of u of x, and find possible equations for u of x and v of x. Let's do it similar to how we did number 25, where we will identify a possible 
uh, equation just of one of them, and then we'll see if that fits the equation of the other one. So let's look at, we have u of v of x is equal to 1 over x squared minus 1, or v of u of x is equal to 1 over x minus 1 squared. We're looking at this, which one uh, looks like there's one function inside another one? If I looked at this, I'd first see immediately that it looks like there's an x minus 1 in here. So let's try that. Let's try saying that u of x is equal to x minus 1. Then v of u of x becomes 1 over u of x squared. Okay, well then what would v of x be? v of x would be 1 over x squared. But now we need to make sure that that fits this uh, other option up here, the the u of v of x equal to 1 over x squared minus 1. So if we use this as our v, and this is our u, what would u of v of x be? Well, u of v of x would then be uh, something minus 1, because I'm going to replace the x with v of x. But what is v of x? v of x is 1 over x squared minus 1. Now, is this the same thing as this here? It actually isn't. So let's try uh, something else. Instead of taking the v of u of x, let's try starting with the u of v of x. So if we're looking at u of v of x, If we're looking at u of v of x, we have 1 over x squared minus 1. Well, here we have this x squared in there. So maybe we could say that v of x is equal to x squared. Well, then what would u of v of x becomes 1 over u of x minus 1. Sorry, v of x minus 1. So what is u of x going to be? We're going to replace the v of x with a x, so we get 1 over x minus 1. If we now check that down here, and we check v of u of x, using our u of x and our v of x that we got, we would get uh, x, we get, instead of x squared, sorry, v of x is x squared. So we're going to have something squared. We're going to have 1 over x minus 1 squared, because we're going to plug in what u of x is. If we do that, well, we can simplify a fraction squared by squaring the top and squaring the bottom. And so we do actually get 1 over x minus 1 squared, which is what v of x, u of x, v of u of x should be. So we found our a possible solution for v of x is x squared and a possible solution for u of x is 1 over x minus 1. This is more trial and error, but you just need to check, just like 25, only now, once you get a possible solution, plug it in the reverse way and see if you can solve for it. For number 27 now, it's saying find u of x so that q of x is equal to p of u of x. Well, we know that q of x is equal to p of u of x, right? Well, q of x is the square root of x minus 3, and then p of x is 2x minus 3. But what are we going to plug in for x instead of p? We're going to plug in a u of x instead of an x. So right here we have an x. We're going to use a u of x in there. So I'll, I'll write that in here. Well, then we need to ask ourselves, what does u of x have to Now we just solve it algebraically. We're trying, to get, we're trying to solve for u of x, so we'll get u of x by itself. Let's add 3 to both sides, and these will actually cancel. And we end up getting square root of x is equal to 2u of x. Divide by 2, and we end up getting u of x is equal to square root of x over 2. So on this one, it's not actually that tricky. All we have to do is start with our, the equation that we want to have, that we want to be true. And then plug in what we know. We know q of x, we know p. 
but instead of we know p of x, so instead of x, we're going to plug in a u of x. Then we solve the equation algebraically. Let me clear up some space for number 28. For number 28, uh, it says let r of x be equal to 3x minus 4 over 2x plus 5. Find r inverse of x. Well, I'm going to write this out as y is equal to 3x minus 4 over 2x plus 5. And then we're trying to find r inverse of x. So we're trying to solve this equation uh, for x now. So a lot of people start this by switching the x and y's and solving for them. But you lose a little bit of meaning there. You can do it it'll, algebraically. It'll work. But you need to keep in mind that really this is a function in terms of x. And so r inverse of x is a, func is a solution of x in terms of y. It's swapping the variables. Here, x and y are just variables. But they, in the real world, they carry meaning with them. So what I'm going to do is solve this out. I'm going to solve this for x. Algebraically, it'll work the same if you switch the x and y's and solve for y. So if, it, if you're more comfortable doing that, feel free to do that. Just keep in mind what, that you swap the meaning now. Well, if we're going to solve this for x, the first thing we should do is get all the x's to the top. So I will multiply both sides by 2x plus 5 just to move this piece to the top here. So I'm, do, I'm doing that using multiplication. Now let's distribute my y. I get 2xy plus 5y is equal to 3x minus 4. Uh, we should then group all the x's together on one side. So I'm going to subtract the 3x to this side and add the and subtract the 5y to that side. I get negative 4 minus 5y. Now, these both have an x, so I'll factor that out. I get 2y minus 3 times x is negative 4 minus 5y. Finally, divide by the 2y minus 3, and I get my answer. x is equal to uh, negative 4 minus 5y over 2y minus 3. But this is saying find r inverse of x. So it wants our, ver our equation to in the end be in terms of x. But it's not the same x as this x. This notation r inverse of x is swapping the x and y. So uh, in order to make it fit the equation properly, I'm now going to swap my x and y. It's a lot easier to see what your meaning of the functions are when, when you swap them after you have the equation worked, worked out. So I'm going to swap my x and y's. This is a 4, by the way, so don't confuse that because of my poor handwriting. I apologize. So swapping the x and y's, I end up getting y is equal to negative 4 minus 5x divided by the 2x minus the 3. And that ends up being my equation, r inverse of x.